Mm. Hello, everyone. Watching, listening. Good morning from California this time. Welcome back to the Free Radical Podcast, episode number eight. And this is your host, Swami Patmanam, here today. Very happy to be in the company of a recently discovered friend and yet another sister, companion in this beautiful Bhakti project, Danya Dasi. Danya, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. So I'll share a few words from uh, Danya's bio. It says like this before beginning. Danya holds a master's degree in counselor education and holds a specialist degree in couples and family therapy. Her clinical training includes trauma-informed care and transpersonal psychology. Her approach focuses on integrated emotional spiritual wellness. She aims to help individuals and relationships thrive with deep spiritual principles at the core of the therapeutic experience. In addition to traditional modalities, Dani is passionate about developing therapeutic tools that incorporate bhakti, bhakti principles and practices as means of reconnecting with our essential nature. Dani has traveled extensively throughout North America, Europe and India, teaching and leading retreats aimed at empowering those seeking transformation and healing. She serves both local and worldwide child protection efforts, including training and education. She has traveled across the globe, sharing Kirtan and original songs, touring alongside fellow devotional artists, the Mayapuris. So I'll share the link to con for those who would like to contact Dania here on Instagram. You have the two options, Dania Wellness or Dania Music. So... I met, yeah, I met Dania personally a few, maybe weeks ago, probably a few months ago. Uh, I think first time we contacted each other was a message that Dania sent me via Facebook or something like that, appreciating some of my classes and somehow there was an extended invitation to meet each other in, when I was about to visit Alachua a few months after that. And that happened. I had the fortune of visiting her and her dear husband Bali and the kids and her mother and her sister and the whole dynasty basically <laughs> even 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 Daniel's father wrote to me a very beautiful message being him in in Venezuela at that time so here we are continuing to develop the connections here where where it takes us so Daniel let's begin as I like to to ask my guests a few words of what doesn't mean radical personalism to you well, um, well, I wanna I wanna appreciate being here with you and the invitation to share, um, and I think that that it's in connection with your question because in in listening to your lectures, which I sort of happened upon, you know, friends of friends like Namras and Jai Jagannath, you know, people that I that I admire and that I, um, you know, I I listen to their counsel and I consider them like kind of mentor friends. Um, you know, through their relationship with you, I became <clears throat> inspired to listen to your talks and your presentations. And that also made me feel very inspired, especially during a time where I feel like I was experiencing, um, yeah, a need for nourishment and a different tone and a different um, mood, something that was fresh and exciting. And that's, that's exactly, I think that's how I described um, your talks when I wrote you, that they were very fresh and they were very exciting. And, um, you know, so for me that it connects to your question because radical personalism for me is getting to know the essence and the mood of each person's spiritual experience and how that only adds to the dynamism of our own spiritual experience. So through relationship, getting to know the unique, totally unique, impossible to replicate, never before existed flavor of each person's you know, spiritual essence and realizing like, wow, that adds to this enormous cornucopia that we eventually present to Radha Krishna as our offering. And to the extent that I contact that in other people in an authentic way, it can actually heighten and expand my own authentic expression of devotion. So I, I, I feel like I experience that like very palpably in, in listening to you and, and, and it also in being connected to our mutual friends. So I think just the relationship that we're developing here is a perfect example of that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would have liked to know that definition myself that you had just given and do copy paste and include it in the book. <laughs> but 
<laughs> long. <laughs> but I'm, I'm happy and fortunate to hear that for not only from you, from other people. That's mm. it's kind of a maybe masochist exercise I'm doing to people. Tell me what's radical personalism. And they share such beautiful definition. Like, why I didn't include that? <laughs> I mean, you, each one of you have to write, to write your own book on radical personalism. That's my point. It's not the, it's not my book. It's just mm -hmm. mentioned beautifully the way of connecting with our unique individuality and, and acknowledge the, the interrelatedness of everything, which is quite connected to, to today's topic, basically. The, right. So that was a good trailer you just shared to us. So today's topic is integration through relationships. I really, I, I was trying to ruminate on, on the, those three words before we, we started our podcast today in the morning, kind of a sutra-like meditation, trying to repeat those three words over and over again to see what's what was coming from that chewing, so to say, from that constant ruminating. Uh, and we chose the title with Danya. It's a very interesting combination of words. Uh, I always say, in one sense, all of these titles may seem redundant, may be redundant in the sense that relationships are about integration. If there's no integration, there's no relationships. But we need to qualify these titles a little bit so you understand the implication, because sometimes in the name of relationship we have the opposite we have disintegration and so on like when we i did the a podcast with brenda sunder was called transformative communication in bhakti and i was like well bhakti is all about that so strictly speaking we should call the podcast back the, the episode bhakti only mm -hmm, and everything mm -hmm. else in play but nobody will understand what we'll be talking about. <laughs> so we could also very easily made our title today relationships or integration mm -hmm. one implies the other but mm -hmm. we felt the need to further expand on that and I personally, of course, felt, and I totally agree when Dania suggested this title to me because as you has just heard her credential is a topic that totally fits her, not only her training, but her passion and her way of being. And personally, I feel that's completely crucial uh, in our present times, not only in the Gaudiya community, but worldwide. Uh, so much that I personally dedicated a whole chapter in my book called Individuation. Uh, so let me, as I'm doing usually, let's begin by, let's continue. I will read a brief section from my book, as I used to do, one of the different radicals from part two of the book. And the one corresponding to today's topic will be radical wholeness, which is found in page 70, just in case. So it says like this. Although being itself a personalist tradition, contemporary Gaudiya Vaishnavism sometimes presents the opposite in the form of various shades of disguised impersonalism. This is ex expressed through a lack of human sensitivity and psychological balance, which includes emotional atrophy and endless types of an unaddressed abuses. We need to become whole and human once again. We need to become individuated participants in our tradition and especially and gradually, we need to become edifying elders. We call this radical wholeness. So this particular section inspired the title for today's podcast, and today's episode, Integration Through Relationships. So I don't know, Danny, if you would like to kickstart with something that maybe wanted to be expressed in this precise moment. Yeah, I think that the, the concept of having integration happen through relationships and that actually contributing to our wholeness. There's so much um, personal work that takes place in our sadhana and our reading. And there's so much kind of like of the internal world and contemplation and that should be happening. And, and relationships <clears throat> I think are often framed perhaps because of our own, whatever baggage that we're bringing as something that is counterproductive to that internal mm. world that we're doing or that detracts mm. or takes you away from or something mm. that you need to do as a necessary evil to get back to the internal thing that you were doing. Mm. But I think with the definition that you presented, mm. it's a necessary component in the completion of those studies, in the expression mm. of that devotion. Like you need somewhere to practice whatever it is what's happening in here. <laughs> There's an arena where that needs to take place. And that's actually what makes it whole. That's how you come back to center. And then from whatever you have out there in relationships, you bring that in as new kind of grist for the mill, more information, more data, more input to do the internal work. And, and it's mutually informing. So I think that when we talk about wholeness, 
you know, it's, it's that the entire picture, the inside, the outside, the relationship, and then my personal relationship with Krishna, it's all supposed to fit together. And I, and I think that it's something that hasn't necessarily been framed that way, except for maybe in a more like kind of superficial kind of hokey, well, like, don't offend the Vaishnavas, and we love to do Sankirtan. And you know, it, it <laughs> fits in a kind of formal ritualistic way, like the community is a part of my ritual but it's not necessarily connected to my inner deep contemplative practice. And I think that there's a, some sort of bridge that's missing there. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, I really appreciated the point you made about how sometimes relationships can be conceived. And, and it all begins with our conception of things. So if you have a misconception, if you're misconceiving the conception, I mean, you can just imagine what comes from that. No? Mm -hmm. uh, and our conception, I mean, we use the term Sambanda in our tradition for conceiving, how to conceive everything. And interestingly, the very word Sambanda that sometimes is translated as relationship means Sambanda, everything is connect interconnected mm -hmm. with it. So the very foundational or conceptual orientation we receive is everything is interconnected. So there is interrelatedness as the foundational pattern of existence so in, in other words you don't exist isolated from everything else no you are relationship in yourself so as you mentioned it's so awkward that we somehow for whatever reason <laughs> we have ended in this place where we see relationships as uh, getting in the way of our inner landscape inner culture where actually they are absolutely, at least especially in our tradition, our bhakti tradition is so crucial. The very word Sankirtan, like I like to say, basically entails the implication that we need each other for, for this to work. Because Sankirtan, we say congregational, but it's not just a group stuff in terms of getting numbers for that to happen, but just how much we, we depend on each other for certain things to come that mm -hmm. we are not able to do so by ourselves. And, and that shows that the very blueprint of our existence is interrelatedness. And for me, yeah, your idea of wholeness is, is, is completely in that connection. I mean, integrating and, and to begin with, again, and acknowledging that such a thing is a fact. And as you mentioned, there is a gap there and probably we need a few, I don't know, decades, generation, lifetimes, whatever <laughs> the number, to bridge the gap and to first reach that point of acknowledging that this is not limited to the ritualistic number getting together issue but it's so foundational to our very constitution yeah mm. yeah yeah so sambanda yeah sambanda so on the base of that sambanda we have a bideya no because sometimes we get sambanda means your spirit soul krishna is god you serve him and then abideya is you serve him but <laughs> sambanda means as you mentioned is everything is interrelated and and a proper relationship with everything uh, will be flawed your inner world basically and abhideya will be just the irresistible unavoidable result of understanding that original conception to begin with when you understand everything is in connection with everything Krishna is in the center and love is the main powerful force driving everything the way you will express your, your reply to that information to that orientation will be what we call abhideya or bhakti yeah, and even and even understanding it's interesting because you were saying even the abhideya and even the prayojana, like a proper conception of prayojana implies you fully understand what's the goal that you're trying to get to, which means that you have, thanks to our acharyas and thanks to our lineage and our and our shastra, an understanding of who Krishna as a personality is. And Krishna's all about relationships. Literally, you don't hear about him. <laughs> Outside of his relationships, what makes Krishna Krishna is who he is in relationships. So it seems totally backwards to think that he wouldn't deeply care about what our relationships look like if he, by example, is fully on endlessly and constantly expanding in how invested he is in his relationships. It would be crazy to think that he wouldn't want us to work on that in this life and in our own community with his devotees or with his creations because even people who aren't necessarily you know haven't discovered their bhakti process don't all say non, living don't say non-devotees please yeah we're, we're saying devotees and waiting <laughs> <laughs> um, you know all living creatures have to be a part of that equation because krishna relates with all living creatures you know that's his that, that's his 
um, mercy is that he is equally disposed to all living creatures, the ones that are aware of him, the ones that are not, the ones that are relating to him, the ones that are not, and that's his love. That's how big his love is. So how can we expect to relate to someone who cares so much about relationships if we can't mirror that same care for our relationships that he ostensibly has crafted for us? So it's not like these relationships just kind of arrived on my doorstep and I'm like, well, I have to make the best of a bad bargain or I got to do what I got to do to just like, you know, take off and take out of here. It's he, if I believe that Krishna's personally invested in my spiritual growth and my well being, so that I can integrate and then become my greatest spirit, spiritual potential. And I have to believe that these relationships are a part of that because he put them here. He put me here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I always like to mention in regard, re relation to what you say that Krishna is a, by, is a byproduct of the love of his devotees. Now, the, the particular form he takes as Krishna is carved, so to say, out of the certain love of his devotees. If you take out the Brajavasis, let's say, mm -hmm. and you put Hanuman there, Ramachandra will appear, not Krishna. Right. It's the same right. person, but it's a particular carving, so to say, poetically speaking, of the absolute in terms of how he's impacted by the love of his devotees. So as you mm. mentioned, it's a result of that. If you take out relationships, that's what I mean by love of his devotees, you no longer have Krishna. You have Brahman, which is basically that side of the absolute where there are, there's no relationality, so to say. And I have, I mean, I have no problem with those who are called in that direction, so to say, or inclined there, but it's not our tradition at least. So uh, yeah, as you mentioned, it's almost crazy to conclude that somehow the God we worship, which is so much about relationships, which is a relationship in itself. Yesterday we were giving a lecture here called Fully Human, Fully Divine. And we were talking how actually our conception of God is God is community. No, because we had in the altar here Radha and Krishna. So we don't have one. No, God mm -hmm. is not, in one sense, God is one, non-dual and so on. But at the same time, we can say, Radha Krishna, or, or and of, of course from that you can even expand further, but God is community. You know? Like sometimes Christian mystics will talk also in terms of the Trinity, mm -hmm. and they will say the three are God. It's not that one is God and it became three. He said there are three, and start with the three, start with the notion of God as community. Mm -hmm. And of course we have all these notions of community in terms of the devotees, the eternal associates. So, so yeah, it's crazy technically speaking. <laughs> and we are, I mean, I, I think it's okay. I mean, the only way we can get to the madness we want to attain in our as our goal, divine insanity, probably is first by acknowledging all the other forms of madness that we are still carrying and, and, and how, how grossly sometimes we are contradicting ourselves in terms of, okay, I want this goal, but how we are reflecting the goal we want to attain in our daily relationships, you know, like, for me that's a very important point okay we have a clear idea what's the goal we have a clear description what's going on in that goal so to say it's all about relationality but i will never get there if i do not start to participate in that wherever i am as much as i can i mean it's not that you are completely dysfunctional depersonalized with everyone and suddenly you are found in golok brindavan full mm -hmm. relationship that will be a shock for us we will die of paranoia it's too much relationality <laughs> so, right. so we need to warm up so to say as sadakas whatever we are here yeah absolutely and i and i and to mm. your point about you know i think that for for some of us for me certainly it's it may be hard to to project like okay well then how do i take the mood of galoka vrindavan and plug mm. it into like how i'm going to deal with my coworker today it, it might mm. be difficult to translate that but even in terms of quality right the whole principle of rasa is precise, accurate attunement to the mood. Like you were saying that if Hanuman presents himself, then Krishna responds with the most perfect version of himself to accommodate for Hanuman's devotion and vice versa. Then Hanuman attunes, the reason why he's such a perfect servant of Ramachandra is because he's perfectly accurately attuned to Lord Ram's needs or to Sita Ram's needs. And so it's not necessarily that we need to translate in such a literal kind of um, obvious way some of the things that we read in scripture. It's actually understanding what is the mood. There's a desire of all pure devotees and Krishna's associates and Krishna himself and topmost Srimati Radharani 
for perfect attunement, for accurate reflection of what the needs of the other person is. And so we can take that directly into our relationships. If I'm going to be, you know, conversing with my coworker about a project that we have, attunement, understanding accurately what her needs are, understanding what she's telling me and then reflecting back, all of that stuff I can plug in. So there are like more, sometimes I feel like it can be overwhelming to think about like, okay, then all my relationships have to be on this transcendental platform. And obviously that's the goal, but it starts with things that are like highly, highly practical. And I'm sure Vrinda Sundari talked a little bit about this in terms of, you know, communication, because she's so well-versed in that and, and her training and stuff. It's, it's really about hearing what the other person is saying and validating their experience and then understanding, okay, what's my role? How do I contribute to the well-being of this relationship? What is this person really asking me for? Where am I? Can I reflect on my own personal process and then offer that in vulnerability? So mm -hmm. I think there's a way of grounding that from like, okay, I understand who Krishna is and what he's up to 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then how do I ground that into like, well, I need to go take care of my kids. I need to be in the workplace. I need to relate to my spouse. I need to relate to other devotees and so on. Totally agree. Yeah. That sounds like radical personalism, all that you have said. <laughs> we have to be radically personal with each other and very specific, very unique. And I totally appreciate the point of attunement so we can somehow translate Krishna Lila in our daily life. Because if not, we create this kind of like gap and total dichotomy, like, hey, this is my goal. But my daily life has nothing to do with that goal. Yeah. And my family is Maya and my wife is dark well and my kids are like foot shackles. <laughs> because you are not because you idealize the ideal way of relating is how the Brajabas say doing. So you become a literalist and you kind of impose that template. And that creates like you can imagine a minimum dysfunctionality at every step of your daily life. <laughs> and that's not the way to reach Golok Brindown, I can tell you. I mean, at the end of the day, you may be a clinical case. So who will want such a guy in Golok? They will be very disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, I totally agree that it's we have to be very like crafty and very creative in how I'm very intelligent. Okay, that's Golok, but what's the essence of that relationality? And where I am now and how do I begin to, I remember I made some lectures some months ago at the end of the Radical Personalism series in terms of how to start to participate in Lila here and now. Mm. And, and maybe some people may felt like, okay, now comes some Sahaja content, imitation, <laughs> yes, well, okay, whatever. No, I, I will appear with a sari in the class. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're ready for that moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everything can happen with Sami Padmanabha at this point, <laughs> anyhow. So yeah, my point was basically that. Let's uh, let's hear the Leela or hear those descriptions of what's going on in the ultimate transcendence, but also let's draw, extract from that principles and teachings that we can translate into our most ordinary moments of our daily life. As I like mm -hmm. always to quote Thomas Merton, he would like to say that our salvation begins in the most ordinary moments of our daily life. If we are not able to, to relate in those moments to the highest ideal who knows how we are conceiving all those things yeah <laughs> absolutely i think i think that's that last your merton um quote is so perfect because mm -hmm. that's when you know what really is contained within the vessel you know like it's only when you squeeze the orange that you're like, okay, orange juice is coming out because you only know what juice is there and contained when the, when the squeeze comes. And it's in the ordinary moments, in our ordinary, seemingly mundane relationships, in our day-to-day, -day, in the moments where we're feeling <clears throat> fragile, vulnerable, distressed, um, pressured, that's when the squeeze comes. And then you see, okay, so, so what's really in there? You know, if I have my comfort zone, my sadhana might look amazing and my, you know, relationships might look amazing from within my little kind of bubble of things that don't push me beyond my comfort zone. But once I'm outside of that, then that's really when I get to test what I'm really made of. And that's, that's one of the functions, not the only function, it's one of the functions of a relationship is to highlight potential blind spots mm -hmm. in my personal and my spiritual relationship. And that's not something that I should resent or that I should resist. It's something that I should welcome because potentially what that's doing is up leveling my spiritual development in a way that I can't possibly do on my own. Right. I just, I, I heard of, I was listening to a podcast recently 
about a woman who was saying, you know, I, I do these exercises in the gym and I feel like they're difficult. Like I actually feel like they're hard exercises. I feel strained, but I'm not seeing muscle development. And the trainer responded and said, you are probably doing a difficult exercise. You are probably pushing yourself. But the reality is that the muscle will only develop once you've pushed it to the point of exhaustion. And the reality is you are probably not able to push yourself to that point. Someone needs to push you to that point, yeah. right? So you need a trainer, you need somebody else. So without necessarily the hierarchical in implication of a trainer and a student, we're really never going to push ourselves to the yeah. point of muscle exhaustion, emotionally and spiritually, the way that we are pushed when we're in relationship. And so it's a necessary component of our growth to be kind of interlocked with other people. And then they kind of <laughs> shift in a direction where I'm like, wow, I, I would have never brought myself here for better or for worse. I would have never brought myself here. And now what I'm called to do is use my spiritual values, my spiritual practices, my understanding, and also reaching for help from other relationships. Right. So then it's like a domino effect where I push into other relationships to seek the support and grow in a way that I probably would never grow on my own. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's I will translate that acknowledgement that of what you just mentioned, like genuine humility. You now, like I acknowledge, probably I will never go there by myself. You know? mm. I don't, ha I don't have that that relishment outside of my comfort zone. So, and I'm, I'm, I'm willing to go there. I'm willing to acknowledge I'm not willing to go there, <laughs> but I will. I know that I need to go there, and 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 for me, that's kind of the prayer of. Like Kunti Devi, when she's asking apparently for problems, and some of my, if you try to do copy paste of those sections, you end up maybe being a masochist or, or bringing a whip. Uh, but as you mentioned, for me, it's more I want to acknowledge my blind, blind spots, as you mentioned, uh, and I'm willing to be. I I know that I need to be tested. I know that I need to. I, I know I want to see who am I in the test arena, so to say. For, that will be for me the contemporary translation of Bipodas and Tathasas, but this shloka from the Bhagavatam, because mm. if not, it's like, Krishna, give me problems, give me suffering, it's never enough, and how we are translating that inside mm. of us. Mm. But actually it means, put me in a situation where I will be challenged enough as to really see who I am, how much I need you, how powerless I am in certain situations, and that may inspire proper surrender and as you mentioned this idea of material ex you spoke about exhaustion and, and there is this verse from her where she says Akinchenagocharam you are the one who is approached by those who are materially exhausted. And again generally we don't organize a, pro a self program for self exhaustion. No I, say, I will do this so I reach this point where no no but the dynamics of of relationality and, and, and community I was thinking about community when you mentioned that because uh, and, and I was thinking about the potential pitfalls for a person like me. You know, I am a sannyasi, uh, and at present, I mean, for 20 years in my life, I've lived in community, and that has been so beautifully challenging. <laughs> but now I'm more in the dynamic of traveling quite a lot. Although, I mean, I, I felt that call, but also I'm I'm missing my community on a daily basis, so to say, physically speaking. Um, let's see what happens, what Krishna's plans have. And I was think, reflecting when you were talking about how much being in relation with others on a daily basis gives a very necessary challenge. And sometimes people like me or monks or acharyas or gurus or people in certain position where they travel and they are more like, I'm not saying I'm telling people what to do. <laughs> people expect that, but it can be very tricky. It can be very dangerous because we can become very isolated from exposing ourselves to those uh, dynamics of relationality that point to our blind spots and working on them and having relationships with people on a daily basis that they know you, they know your blind spots, they all will point at you and, and we should be willing to do that. And, and sometimes dynamics like, like mine, I, I'm trying to be uh, introspective with myself, can be very delicate in terms of escaping from all that you know, because you are one week here nobody gets to see your blind spot but they are about when they are about to see it, you are already traveling somewhere else <laughs> so it, it can be i mean if probably address is healthy but if not it can be just a constant escape from from your own shadow basically sure well i can i can understand how that might be very challenging um 
for 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 both reasons one is as you're mentioning you know just as someone's about to encounter your shadow you're like i'll see you next year we'll saw hi ball and then you just kind of roll out um but also i can imagine you know like you were saying you miss your community in the sense that there's something nourishing and grounding and supportive about receiving love and 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 there's a certain consistency that's nice about seeing the same people and and so i can understand how that could definitely be challenging and at the same time i'm i'm wondering if maybe you know there's so much difficulty and strife that comes from the era of telecommunications and internet and everything. But it seems like also one of the uh, advantages of it is that there is a certain consistency that you can maintain with your relationships, even though you're traveling around and kind of orbiting the planet that, um, you know, you have these well wishers. And I think that that's an experience that we've all kind of had. And I, perhaps that was amplified during COVID, which is um, leaning into relationships that were geographically, distant but that actually nourished a deep inner part of ourselves and perhaps the fact that it happened across a screen or that it happened through email or through classes that we heard later it was a way of being able to open up in a safer way because mm -hmm. sometimes relating on the day-to-day -day, it creates a little bit of a callus mm -hmm. to how we interact with people so mm -hmm. i can see kind of both sides of that a little bit yeah yeah thank you for giving some giving me some hope <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I'm not. I'm not complaining about my present life dynamics or, or anything like that. And yeah, I totally agree. And I, I try to keep those uh, deep connections somehow or other. In this case, online mostly. Uh, and I acknowledge the importance of them. Just even in my, in my in my particular situation as a monastic, and I don't want to turn this podcast into my unauthorized self autobiography or something, but. <laughs> But yeah, it's so important to to keep close relationship with people that really know you and relate to you as who you are, one to one. There's no an overdose of kijais. Uh, there's not like a an abyss of Aishwarya, Jai Maharaj, Jai Maharaj. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> so that's so grounding and so like, yeah, so sobering basically, and reminds you who you who you actually are. Besides all the labels and all the designations and all the. Well, I think that relationships are so challenging sometimes that <clears throat> for people in, in a certain ashram, especially if that ashram, by accepting disciples or by being in a didactic position of teaching or instructing mm -hmm. or sharing information, that it clicks into a hierarchy. And because of, again, baggage or whatever, and also a little bit of relational laziness, mm -hmm. um, we like a formula. Oh, he's a Mara. So this is what I have to do. I have to serve him this kind of food and talk to him in this way. And then he offers me these blessings and then I'm super humble and he's super merciful. And then, and then he leaves and we all feel very like, oh, okay, my Bhakti creeper has been nursed, mm -hmm. but it's a formula. It's literally a formula that I'm just plugging in. I'm not getting to know this person. He's not getting to know me. You know, we're not, ex we're not really digging into the to the like deeper soil of our relationship and getting into like, okay, then what, what does this relationship dynamic mean and how does it function and how do I really attune? It's just a formula. This is a Swami, this is a person, and this is how you do that. And then, and it becomes, it's nice to have a little bit of a, a protocol to respect an ashram, but it's a totally different operation when you say, I believe that this relationship has come into my life because Krishna wants me to serve and wants me to benefit from deeply rooting into the connection that, that has just been born. And I, and I think that it's a totally different appreciation. I think that in our spiritual society, for whatever reason, it does become quite formulaic and that leaves it very shallow. And, and in a mo in the moment, it feels a little euphoric, like, wow. And then afterwards you're like, did that nourish me in any way? Did it satisfy me in any way? Or was it just feeling like I belonged because I followed the protocol and, you know, it, it helps me feel my sort of societal or social identity is approved of, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And, and that's not belonging, at least not for me, that's fitting in at best. Right. Not real belonging is what you were just describing, but if not, it's just like a mere social performance sometimes. No, as you mentioned, you learn the, you know, learn the script whether as the sannyasi or as the other person, you, you know what to do, what to say, what not to say. Don't forget the donation in between. <laughs> All these types of like steps. Okay, okay, now is the moment of doing this. If I do not do that, that's offense. If I do mm -hmm. that, I'll get the mm -hmm. blessings. And we start also to conceive the whole spiritual project as like a very formulaic thing. Like if I do this, I'm saved. If I do not this, I'm, I'm condemned. And 
and it's so superficial it's so impersonal basically mm -hmm. to be honest it's completely uh, completely impersonal and i've seen that for those who are in the position of a teacher as you mentioned in the didactic hierarchy whatever um they can remain so they can become so isolated and so disconnected from and they cannot sustain their vows because they start to feel lonely <laughs> because yeah. they have balked into this performance principle and and that's what i'm supposed to do to keep the the crowd happy or inspired but as you mentioned that inspiration sometimes it just a weekend dopamine peak <laughs> yeah and then and then and then as a member of the crowd am i um creating an environment or co-creating an environment where that person's isolation for lack of a better word is unsustainable <laughs> because i'm also not nourishing the relationship with personalism mm -hmm. right i'm depersonalizing a swami or a teacher or a guru or whatever by seeing them as their position not as a person who might also have emotional and spiritual needs and it's not a contradiction of my humility to say that i can contribute to that by having a personal relationship right mm -hmm. and and i think kind of what you were speaking about which is like I went through all the steps of the ritual and then that means that I'm, you know, excelling in my spiritual life. It has that like tone of achievement orientation of like climbing the ladder, which is like totally counter to the nature of bhakti proper, Grace, you know, Grace. like in the, yeah, in the Madhuri Kadambini in the, in the first shower talks about um, uh, bhakti being completely independent and how it can serve other functions, but it's never conditioned by or qualified by or achieved by anything else. And there's like a karmic, there's like a karma vibe. When you say, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this, it increased my bhakti. It's like, that's totally not how it works. Mm -hmm. And counterintuitively to, to that paradigm, I think it's also in that same section, it says that Sometimes the devotee can give you bhakti before even Krishna himself is giving you bhakti. That mm -hmm. Krishna manifests through the devotee and the devotee is empowered to increase your bhakti within the, the, the relationship itself. So Krishna is so loving and Krishna loves the way his devotees love one another so much that he, Bhakti Devi is able to manifest herself through the devotee to another devotee, even before that devotee might have achieved it directly in relating to Krishna himself. Mm -hmm. So again, just the importance of relationship, you know, Krishna says that he greater than worship to him, he esteems worship to his devotees. So it's, it just seems like when we talk about relating to devotees, there's like that surface level, formulaic, ritualistic kind of communal way. And there should be some sort of etiquette. I don't necessarily think that, that, that there shouldn't be certain protocols, but I think we should see them as containers. And then what's filling that container? What's on the inside of that? Yeah, protocols are always in the service of something bigger. And protocols are not the yeah, ants in themselves because if not, yeah, we end up worshiping protocol instead of worshiping the Vaishnavas. And again, worshiping the Vaishnavas is not bring the protocol and that's my worship of the Vaishnav. Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm very formal, I'm very careful, I'm very respectful. I'm worshiping the Vaishnav. I'm doing what the Bhagavatam say. Madhvakta puja biyadika. No, 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 no. They are worshiping the protocol in that case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> worshiping the Vaishnavas, as you mentioned, has more to do with with would relate to them from, from a human and realistic perspective and and yeah i told I, I really love that section you quoted from madhuri Kadamini. i won't go there i talked a lot about it in my first book i won't touch here if back is in <laughs> or not <laughs> you already gave some hints of that mm -hmm. but but yeah bhakti is completely uh independent and and um, unexpected i mean it, it will move in a way rupa goswami said heri bhagati prem but love moves like a snake in a crooked way so you cannot anticipate which will the, will be the next movement. So we cannot, as you mentioned, enter into this um, meritocratic system. Like I do this and this and this, and I deserve bhakti or I earn Krishna's love and I obtain. Because to begin with and to break that whole system is Krishna's already loving everyone unconditionally before you do anything. So that breaks the whole pattern altogether. Like you're not trying to earn. We were talking about that yesterday. That's a very important topic for me that we don't have to earn God's love. He, God, already, as you mentioned before, he's a well-wisher of every living entity. Suridam Sarva Bhutanam, in so many statements in, in the Shastra, Krishna is saying, I'm the best well-wishing friend of every single living entity. Mm. So if that's there to begin with, 
what what's this thing of I try to earn his love and I try to climb this like hierarchy or whatever. And we are yeah filtering our conception of bhakti with so many notions of karma and so on and so forth. We, when our bhakti ideal is to be jnana, karma, adi, and abritam, Rupa Goswami said, no? like devoid of those types of mentalities. Mm -hmm. So let me share one message that Brinda Sundar is sharing since we invoked her name a few minutes ago. She manifested great <laughs> here. <laughs> so, um, well, she mentioned many things. Let's, let's share the first one. She's saying, uh, I'm appreciating this conversation very much. Thank you both. Thank you, Brinda Sundari. Regarding relationships being draining, being draining versus being energizing, versus being, mm -hmm. being energizing, it seems important to be able to identify what we are experiencing in each relationship and to know how to either adjust it so it's mutually life-giving or to know when we are best to create a distance even for healthier reasons. It seems many devotees are challenged to identify and to know how to adjust. Any thoughts on that, Danya? Especially regarding this discernment between, because we are talking about integration through relationships and sometimes some may interpret this, okay, you have to force jump on every relationship so it works <laughs> and yeah. sometimes the, the, the integration at least to begin with may work by some healthy distance and proper appreciation and establishing healthy boundaries and so on and so forth yeah well the the madhya marikari is the is the role model for healthy boundaries right because mm -hmm. there's somebody who is able to relate to krishna in a certain way to elders in a certain way to peers in a certain way to juniors in a certain way and to people who are unfavorable in a certain way and so that's what we're aiming for right from beginner bhakti to develop steady bhakti yeah. then we should know that boundaries are implicit in that and i think you know vrinda sundari is really um narrowing down an important point um sometimes in in my work i like to quote Brene brown who i know you you also like her and she um she says when she talks about trust and intimacy she says that the people that you trust that you really like are able to fully open up vulnerably to you should be able to write all their names on a one inch by one inch square of paper mm. I mean, that's like super tiny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you think about that, you know, this is, and she's somebody who's researched this very thoroughly and she's a big advocate of vulnerability and relationships and why it's so important. So it's, again, it's not quantity, it's quality. Because then again, I hit that achievement orientation. If I'm like, I'm friends with everybody in the community and everybody trusts me. And I tell them all of my, I relate to everybody fully openly and I share all of my everything. With, that's again, impersonalism because I'm merging them into one giant blob of things people that i want to relate to that i've objectified as the other person in the relationship so that my bhakti grows and i'm just going to spill all, all over everybody and I, I think that's also inappropriate and not everybody is for everybody in our embodied conditioned state there are certain personality traits there are certain backgrounds there's some that I might be more prone to become vulnerable with and relate to in a way that is conducive for my spiritual life as it is right now. And I think that boundaries, in order for them to be healthy, they have to be clear, but they also have to be flexible. So where I'm at in my spiritual life now and the association that is most conducive for my bhakti now, it may look different in five years. It may look different in 10 years. I've, I've experienced that. My relationships definitely looked a little different before having kids and after having kids or, you know, according to the different societal shifts, you know, who I took instruction from, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I think that that's natural. I think it's a sign of intelligence. But I think that the other 50% of figuring out who I'm relating to out there is to know myself. And if I don't know myself, if I'm not really doing the work of getting to know my specific kind of conditioning. We're all conditioned souls, but everybody's conditioning is super unique. And that's gonna impact all of my relationships. So if I don't know what's happening on this side of the street, mm -hmm. then I'm not gonna be able to relate properly because I'm gonna be inaccurate mm -hmm. in my presentation of myself and in my understanding of someone else. So there's that, again, that kind of symbiosis between I want to learn and understand of the other person in the relationship but I also really need to deepen my understanding of myself. And the, the other person in the relationship may help me do that, but I also have to be ready to do some of that work myself. And, and it implies, as you said, a lot of humility to be able to do that because 
I might touch into what are the impressions on my subconscious? What is my trauma? What is my background? You know, and, and you start getting into sensitive material and it's very tempting to throw a Gita verse on it or to throw a Prabhupada quote on it or to go on, you know, Harinam and just be like, well, that's all that was needed to do. And it's like, there's, there's something there that needs to be taken care of. And Krishna is also shining a light on that for a reason. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking sometimes, yeah, how how evasive, how we can use relationships to to evade relationships. No, that that's like very classical paradox. Like you are using something to avoid exactly that. No, so you can I don't know invoke an idea of God to exactly avoid what the what's the actual implication of relating to God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or you can, as you mentioned to begin with, like okay, I have all this relationship with all these people. I have uh, full feel my 5,000 friends stuck in Facebook. So I'm so, I love so many people. They love me so much. And we can be using the principle of relationship, the idea, at least our idea, the word relationship to exactly avoid what's the implications of that. Because, yeah, we, we, we may have our own ideas about everything and anything, but the implications of everything, we, we need to play out the implications of things. And generally, many times we are not very expert at that. We, 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 are, we feel that playing out the implications of something can be risky, can be like opening a warm can, you know, like pressing a button. I don't know what will come, as you were describing, because, yeah, we need to know ourselves. We need to, in detail, inspect with surgical precision, <laughs> like hopefully... What's our shadow? What's our the unhealed wounds? Because if not, you are just bringing that baggage into your relationships and whatever, expecting the other person to heal that for you, over expecting, over idealizing your significant other, uh, projecting from tip to toe, and there's no relationship there yet because <laughs> you have not, we have not yet been able to to see us for ourselves. So I think that's also an important point that you mentioned that, that we need to emphasize in our, not only in our community, but in many others, like to know yourself doesn't only mean like, as you mentioned, okay, Bhagavad Gita say I'm eternal spiritual soul. That's who I am. Everything else is illusory and temporary. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you need to know all that stuff to someday say I'm a spirit soul with full weight and full realization. You need to go through. And I, I like always to emphasize this also to go through the, all the messiness of your humanity that's not in, it, only something okay i need to go through that so someday i reject all that stuff and finally i'm a spirit soul but eventually all your humanity and your empiric character and personality and psychology in the context of bhakti will be spiritualized mm. and that will accompany you for eternity so in our particular tradition especially we have less excuses than in any other path probably <laughs> to to do a spiritual bypassing and evade all this shadow work because in our our philosophies, no, no, all your present personality can be fully integrated and participate eternally in bhakti and spiritualized by that. So no need to, to think of that as something eventually will totally disappear, so to say. So that's challenging, but yeah. beautiful, of course. Well, and, and I think to your point, you know, how... how um let's say that we do have these Gita verses, you know, all the classics about who Krishna is. And, my, and I have this, what I, what I believe to be a clear understanding of Sambandha, right? There's me and there's material energy and there's Krishna. And I, and I'm, I, you know, I got it. Right. I wonder, I wonder if you don't have fulfilling, nourishing, mutually encouraging relationships, or you could be fully vulnerable. I really wonder if the Sambandha is clear because because all parts of ourselves touch all other parts in our inner world, I don't see how you can have problematic relationships and not project that onto your conception of Krishna. I don't mm -hmm. see how it happens. I don't know that it's possible to have a completely clean, accurate, clear vision of your relationship with Krishna without the projections of problematic relationships on there because it's not, the nat it's not human nature. Human nature... And there's all kinds of studies. Uh, Vishaka Prabhu, she has this incredible presentation when she presents about you know, women's experience in, in the movement. She categorizes all these different kinds of biases. And there are biases where basically I learned something in one area of my life and just by nature of my brain working the way it works, I, I kind of globalize that and I make that a lesson for all other parts of my life. So, you know, for example, how, how many of us 
who have you know certain experience with our parents don't project that parental experience onto our conception of Krishna. Krishna is a punishing God, or Krishna is a disciplinarian, or Krishna is authoritarian, or Krishna is being uh, too permissive, you know, whatever it is. And so, I, of course, it's my nature because that's how I learn in this human experience. Through relationships, I learn about all other relationships. Mm -hmm. And that's it's the nature of like, is the world safe or not? We learn that as babies. So that how is that not going to translate into our spiritual life? That cross-contamination, for lack of a better word, is inevitable. And so I think that it's also kind of fooling ourselves that we can actually create a divide of this is my spiritual life and this is my material life. I don't think that that's real. Mm -hmm. Or at the very best, that boundary holds too much tension to be sustainable. And I think that that's something that, especially as a second generation devotee, I think that that's something that is a point of contention for us, which is, you know, even it, the, the, the longest running study of human beings in, in social and psychological realms is the Harvard study of development. And they rendered the result that the number one determinant of a satisfying, healthy life is the quality of your relationships. Mm -hmm. So if that's true, right? then what's happening with people who've been practicing for 30, 40, 50 years? Why aren't their relationships seemingly thriving? And mm -hmm. what does that say about what's going on in terms of Sambandha, in terms of like an actual transcendent understanding of our own personal relationship to God? If that doesn't fit, then uh, there's a lot of questions that I have about that. I have those questions myself as well, yeah. Yeah, and, and I totally agree with Sambanda being, we can be so reductionistic in terms of, get into official definitions, as you mentioned. Okay, I know who Krishna is, who I I mean, or, or to start a sentence saying, I know, yeah. you are a potential public danger, basically. Uh, and we have a lot of that. I, I talked in my book about that. We have this kind of theological arrogance because our tradition has so many details about everything that so easily we can think, I, I know already who Krishna is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know most, more than any other person in any other mystical tradition who God is. I know... And then we get accustomed to this idea of beginning uh, our answer saying, I know, and we lose touch with the possibility of beginning a sentence saying, I don't know. <laughs> and that's so necessary, so healthy to keep some healthy, some, as I like to say, some uh, epistemological modesty. Like you have to be modest about, humble about how I'm approaching and understanding everything. Yeah, I know, but... Uh, I'm not so sure that I know fully. I mean, I'm dealing with God here, with the infinite. How much can I claim certainty mm. in the direction of the absolute? <laughs> but we, we we do that a lot. I mean, not only go with it happens everywhere. But here we are speaking in the context of our tradition. And, and interestingly, what you were telling about our, our ideas of God and how much they are like filtered by our own experience. Just yesterday in the class, we were talking about that. I was mentioning one book. I cannot recall the name now. I can do my research for later, but which mentioned that most of the people that, for example, are atheists, officially they declare themselves as such. There are some studies done. Basically, 99% of them have problems with their father and mother, authority figures as childhood, in the child, in the child stage. So they were projecting that. So I, my, my, my parents were so whatever, authoritarian, horrible in one sense or another, God is, cannot exist. No, I don't want a second one like that. I don't want another bring into the picture another guy of that. That will be too much trauma for me. I mean, that's one example in how this projection can happen. Of course, we may say, well, but we are not atheists. We don't have that projection. We may not have that projection on right. that level. And, and we may be more dangerous than overt atheists that say, I don't believe in God and whatever. But we may say, I believe in God, but you just project it's such a distorted picture of that. And, and, and there is a difference between our ideas about God and God. <laughs> our ideas about who Krishna is and who Krishna is. Now, Krishna is a real person. And sometimes our ideas about that real person may be totally not only Unreal, but surreal, I will say. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's important, as you mentioned, to constantly humble ourselves and making this exercise of, okay, who I think God is. Because I will, I should never be too sure about who Krishna is. I mean, he's always becoming more of himself. So how much can I claim I got him? He, he himself doesn't get him. He's still trying to under. That's the whole thing of Gorlila. Right. I don't want to go there. That's a, a journey. <laughs> 
<laughs> but but that's Krishna further exploring the depths of his own heart. Sri Radha is Krishna's own heart, and he's just fully dedicated to exploring that. And the Lila has to be eternal because there is no end to how much he can explore that bottomless mm -hmm. ocean. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there are verses I quote in my book, Krishna is the Vedas personified saying, you yourself do not know your own limits because you don't have any limits. So you mm -hmm. yourself do not know yourself in one sense. So how much we can say, I know who he is, you know, and claim this, this idea. So, yeah, I think it's very, very important to humble ourselves and and acquire this sense of, I know who Krishna is on some level, but I can always know so much more. And, 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 and to be very careful about what we are projecting and entering into this. And I was talking yesterday with one devotee that was like, yeah, sometimes I, I, I feel I need to watch a movie. I feel I need to whatever. And this guilt trip comes. Like Krishna won't like that. He's not pleased with that. And basically translate that he doesn't like you mm -hmm. for doing this. And you can imagine what's the fruit of that, so to say. So, and, and we create this, as you mentioned, this dichotomy, spiritual life, material life. So my spiritual life is Sunday feast. My material life is the movie I feel I need to watch. <laughs> <laughs> and we live like, um, yeah, we, we like tear apart our lives in two, so to say. And that's not the idea. We were talking today about integration. So... I'm not saying, okay, watching whatever movie is the highest form of bhakti, but somehow in certain stage, you may need that to balance your humanity so you can offer up your humanity in bhakti. So it's, again, it's all about learning to be able to connect those dots properly, not like creating excuses to indulge in nonsense, but <laughs> there is a place to do not think in terms of spiritual life and material life. You know, why, I mean, we choose to create that dichotomy, but ideally everything can be part of the bhakti project, as I like to call it. Sure. Even even his, you know, with, with that example, just following the thread, you know, for him to open up vulnerably to you and say, <clears throat> you know, I felt called to watch this movie because I felt that it was necessary. That was a vulnerable share, you know, in any other, in many other circles, there might've been, you know, some finger wagging of like, well, you know, movies are Maya and you know, whatever. So somehow between you two, there was a creation of enough safety that he was able to share vulnerably. Yeah. And your response ostensibly could create either further that uh, duplicitousness between his you know spiritual and material life or it can deepen the personalism and rescue that person from uh self-betrayal by way of attacking their own self-worth yeah. or because if he has an experience of sharing that with you and Maharaj was just like really understanding he just heard me out I didn't feel judged I didn't feel anything he just you know very took it very lightly and then you know we continued to share we had a nice afternoon and I just felt so connected to him and I'm, I'm so inspired by how he speaks about Krishna you know I've been meaning to read this book all of a sudden sharing about the movie was literally the ticket mm. to up something that opened up a healthy pathway rather than a problematic pathway. So it goes again to show that it's not about the movie. It's not about what this person wanted. It's mm -hmm. about what happened when he shared that with you. What was his experience when he came to you with that? And I think that that's, you know, when we talk about the, the six different loving exchanges, we're like awesome at the prashadam part, the gift giving. I don't know where we're at with that. It's hard to gauge. But with the, with the inquiring and listening and confidence, you know, we're supposed to be the actual thing that we're supposed to be doing that is to inquire in confidence and to listen in confidence about topics relating to Krishna. But in all honesty, and this has been a realization in my work with people and in personal relationships, no one's ever going to share their innermost realizations or fears or feelings about their spiritual life, which is like the center, center, center of everything. Mm -hmm. If they can't even tell you that they want to watch a movie in a safe mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So how many layers in do we really expect ourselves to go if we don't create safety and validation and healthy mirroring on the way outside concentric circles of our interactions? Yeah. And yeah, that will be the topic of a lecture I have to give today in the, in the, in the afternoon called vulnerability and empowerment. So I was thinking about that when you were talking because, yeah, that, that beginning point of the movie was just the po potential portal to... Further trauma, further neurosis, and further abuse, or 
empowerment and clarity and, and just the movie, we, we enter into another movie at that point. Right. <laughs> so to say, then we understood which was the actual purpose of watching the movie. Uh, right. We can celebrate, so to say, the movie. Uh, and I like what you mentioned regarding the, the verse of Upadeshamrita, which is basically about the six types of uh, loving interaction, pretty lakshanam. And I always liked, and maybe I'm <coughs> spinning off reductionism here, but I always like to reduce the six of them to, to the ones you mostly emphasize. Because you say, okay, giving and sharing prasad, and we can also limit that to food, but actually prasad means grace, means mercy. So... And that's tied to the idea of revealing our hearts in, in confidence. That's a way of showing mercy, mm -hmm. giving mercy, allowing ourselves to receive that vulnerability and giving and receiving gifts. Again, it's not just give Maharaj the corresponding donation or something mm -hmm. or Christmas gift just, but one of the first, <coughs> arguably the best gift I can give to other person is my vulnerability. No, So so for me, all these six, all the, the first and last True, so to say, giving and receiving gifts, giving and receiving prasadam can be just made synonymous with revealing your mind in confidence and, sure. and receiving that instead of just, and as you mentioned, that revealing mind in confidence is not about technically. Okay, let's talk about Krishna. No, yes, or, or topics related, you see, topics related to Krishna. And the point is, well, in one sense, as you mentioned, we mentioned at the beginning, everything is related to Krishna. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, he's called Mukya Sambanda. Mukya Sambanda means he with whom everything has its primary relationship. So if if you are proper, if you are sincere and honest, you can be talking about the movie you watched yesterday. And that's a topic related to Krishna because everything is related to Krishna. So if, if we are talking about a movie from a vulnerable place, that's as you mentioned, is way more. Uh, valid and empowering that talking about Krishna directly, literally, with zero vulnerability, mm -hmm. invoking those topics of Krishna Kata as, as a perfect device, facade to avoid having to go to a vulnerable place. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that so many times. I mean, sometimes even I've talked and given lectures on vulnerability, and some like, Maharaj, I'm missing so much your lectures on Gopi Gita. And Brahma Vimoka Lila. <laughs> I really like those lectures. And I'm like, you are a spiritual <laughs> bypassing. <laughs> you no, know, so I mean we have all that potential. We can just give like professional rasik karikata and, and everyone's like, mm, so nice. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we are using all that device to cheat each other, basically, or like you mentioned, self-betrayal. That's a powerful word and that's the worst thing we can end up doing basically you know? we have so many tools to do it <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's a, it's a it's a dangerous proposal because um then what i'm doing is denying that there is it, it, it's such a weapon of self-betrayal because i'm denying that there's spiritual potential in my relationships and their spiritual potential in another jiva. But if I understand that all jivas are spiritual sparks, just like myself, even though we're unique, we're all made of the same spiritual energy. Essentially, it's a comment on my own self-worth. Mm -hmm. I can't find spiritual realization relating to that person. They're a jiva. I'm a jiva. I don't have mm -hmm. spiritual worth. So mm -hmm. it's a very, I don't think that it's conscious. I don't think that there's malice. I think that it comes from a place of honestly our earliest programming, and there's so much evidence to show this, that our earliest programming, our early home life really colors the way that we walk in this world. Mm -hmm. And so if there's trauma, if there's a lack of safety, if there's invalidation, if there's a denial or a, a kind of brutalization of our self-worth, we're gonna walk around with that wound and we're going to dump that into our relationships or we're gonna flee from our relationships, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that, it kind of brings it back, and, and this, is, this is some of the service that I do and, and the things that I'm passionate about. It's like, well, then what's happening with our current creations of home life? Where are our kids being raised? How do we treat our children, and how do we treat the people who are with our children the most? <laughs> Which basically is women, right? Because women, by and large, are the primary or the, the majority caretakers of children. So it doesn't make sense on a societal basis to want to focus on these really high Rasik topics, if at the same time we are programming mm -hmm. our children 
to interpret the environment, even spiritual environments, as dangerous, unsafe, uh, not capable of holding our vulnerability, where they can't really be authentic, they can't really be themselves. If there is no authenticity, there is no spiritual growth because you mm -hmm. don't have an accurate assessment of where you are so that it's impossible to know where to grow. Mm -hmm. So all of those things are like completely interrelated and it locks into how do we raise our kids? How do we treat women? And knowing that that's actually the key to unlocking like the deepest sense of authenticity because there's unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, safety, resources, support, mm -hmm. mutually loving relationships, not just in that one household, but in the entire community. And then when you have that healthy psyche to work with, then you start planting these seeds of the Gita verses and oh, yeah. the Brahma Samhita, you know. And you can understand the Lila in a more realistic way once you are properly grounded in your psyche and human emotionality, you can actually, again, do not filter and pro project your own unresolved trauma into the Lila and read the Lila according to your unresolved stuff, which mm -hmm. happens a lot. No? So, and yeah, and I, and I really, I was thinking when you were talking about this idea that most of the worst things sometimes that are done in the world are not necessarily by bad people, but mm -hmm. just by good people that is unaware of the unresolved stuff they have, and they end up doing the many times the worst type of damage and, and creating the biggest trauma for so many people. It's not that they are bad people in themselves. They are good people, but totally uh, being, how to say, instrumentalized by their unconscious, so to right. say, but totally. all the unresolved stuff that is just carrying them to do, to replicate, mm -hmm. so to say, the pattern. <laughs> unresolved pattern that was brought generationally and uh, yeah it requires lots as you mentioned authenticity you use that word and for me every time I, I heard the word authentic I translate that is in my mind as, as sadhu what does it mean to be a sadhu and sadhu again it's not just like some people with an aura that enters float <laughs> in your room or something but we are all invited to be sadhus, and sadhu comes from the word sat. Sat means truth. Mm. The truth means an honest person, authentic person. For I translate sadhu as authentic, authentic person, basically. So in that sense, we are invited to be sadhus. And I'm, again, kind of redefining words here because sometimes we hear sadhu, and again, our programming triggers like, okay, this is sadhu. And you go like, mm -hmm. it has to be a monk, it has to be a pure devotee, it has, and you go like to the particular notion you have instead of grounding it like to the immediacy of where you are and okay to be a sadhu is an invitation for me mm. to be fully authentic and honest wherever i am and to explore acknowledge unresolved layers uh, of my psyche as you mentioned let's begin there with let's let's give that our initial definition of sadhu then we can go mm -hmm. to the more romantic idyllic ideas of that. but let's begin at home so to say so yeah one thing that comes to mind, because you were talking about it a little bit more, and I mentioned that in my reading of, of the section we shared today on radical wholeness, I'd like to touch upon that also, the notion of elderhood, no? mm -hmm. because we are talking about, okay, we are in a movement, there is different generations, you are part of a second generation of devotees. And I've, t I've been talking with many, some proper disciples and devotees from the first generation, so to say. And they were even asking me, like, Maharaj, what does it mean to be an elder? Because we, I, we know that we are expected to be elders. We know that young generations are looking up to us. But also we want to know what they are looking up to us, what we are supposed to give. So I don't know if you have any initial thoughts on the, on the idea of elderness and elderhood in connection to, to this system of relationships where, again, there's some hierarchy in that sense you have the mother the child you have the elder of the community of the tribe ideally hopefully <laughs> and but everyone is learning from each other and nourishing each other but it's important to have elders so i don't know what you have to say about that yeah i think you know it's it's difficult because i think part of and and um richard Rohr he talks about this in his work i know that he's someone that you um yeah. read and, and admire he talks about the the grief that we suffer as a society for lack of rites of passages. And what he does in his work is that he creates retreats and experiences where he can create a rite of passage, especially for young men, and <clears throat> because it's something that is lost. And I think that 
when we speak about elders, it can't be a chronological thing. Oh, I've been serving for X amount of time. Oh, no. You know, <clears throat> because... And we may need to bring down that myth, so to say, because there's so much of elder, senior devotees, 14 years, whatever. So I, I it sounds basic and common sense. We may need to pound that post a little bit. Yeah, well, I think it brings itself down. <laughs> I think that the, the, it's a self it's a self-evident... Yeah. Uh, situation. I think that elderhood is it has to do with embodied wisdom. Yeah. It's wisdom that's self-evident, just like being a guru is self-evident. It's not mm -hmm. something that someone else has to confirm for you or that someone else has to validate or verify or, you know, um, being an elder speaks for itself. And I think the reason why we ask ourselves like, well, what is an elder? It's because there's a lack of presence because if mm -hmm. we saw them abounding, we would just know that's mm -hmm. an elder. <laughs> they want, and I think that that's what people felt when they encountered Srila Prabhupada for the first time. Mm -hmm. It's, I don't think these people were walking around like I'm looking for an elder. Where can I find an elder? And then they saw mm -hmm. Prabhupada and they're like, well, he seems to check all the boxes. I think this man is an elder. I think it was such a, an obvious experience that was transmitted through this person's embodied wisdom that the person instructed the concept. The person tells you this is what being an elder is. And so I think that that's going to encompass different, different things according to different personalities. One is, is a certain steadiness and palpable, evident growth. Mm -hmm. you know, where they can reveal in their biography or in other people's tellings of their, you know, spiritual path, a constant hunger for growth, improvement, elevation that doesn't just mm -hmm. fill them, but it actually spills over into everybody that they contacted, mm -hmm. where their wealth of spiritual realization feeds and nourishes the people around them. And that's really, you know, when you think about even like a, a, a genogram, which is like the map of someone's family, like this person had two babies and they too had four kids and they married, whatever. It's supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be like this mm -hmm. tree that branches out spiritual energy, right? The grandmothers and the grandfathers, so to speak, archetypally of our society are people who are supposed to help nourish and birth growth and spiritual realization for others. So I think that there has to be a steady spiritual practice. I think that there have to be rites of passage and walking alongside people through tribulations and transformations of the spiritual society. So this can mean things like walking through experiences of people leaving their bodies and accompanying them through that and watching the, the generations morph and change. It can also be the transformation and growth and reformation of authority and structure and management and you know all of that people who, who usher in the new era mm. and can hold the container of the essential things so the elders are the people who say this is what's important and we're going to keep this center we're going to keep the main thing the main thing and we're going to help you figure out as a society as a movement as a community what is ready to fall away and shedding that kind of old snake skin of like this was useful and now it's ready to fall away and we're ready to birth something in it's somebody who's ready to hold your hand and walk through that because their faith is so steady and they've already seen so much they've seen the transformations happen they're able to study history and see how it's happened so many times before and they're able to see into the future and see how the need is coming they're able to help call in a new era those are elders and they're people who can encourage literally give courage to everybody to step into that new era very confidently with full faith and few, full humility and knowing that really nothing happens without Grace giving her blessing to whatever's going to happen. But basically, they're usually visionaries yeah. who are able to see. You know, my mom will sometimes give the example of like the headlights on a car. And she used to tell us like, your headlights are small, so you can see a few feet away, but my headlights are big, so I can see a little bit further. And that's, what, that's who I am as a mom. I can see a few steps ahead what's being called in and I'll mm -hmm. walk with you. It's not enough to say, hey, there's a problem in management. You guys should go figure that out. And there's a problem with, you know, the guru institution. You guys should go figure that over there. There's a problem with book distribution. You guys should. It's basically saying, I see what's necessary and I'm going to walk as long as I can and as far as I can with you into that fire. And I'll steady you. I'll steady you by my strength, mm 
-hmm. by my consistency, by my realization, my own embodied humility, I'll walk with you. You can lean on me. I think that's what, that's what elder energy feels like to me. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> that was an inspired sermon, Dania. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I will think about, yeah. I always like to say that for, for, for there to be a constructive criticism of anything or anyone, not only you have to check first, the first boxes you have to check is, I'm not projecting my own stuff onto the other person, yeah. but, and I have good intent. I have a constructive, loving intention for that person to to grow. But at the end, is what you mentioned is, I'm telling you that I think this will be important for you to change, and I'm willing to accompany you in that. I commit. I'm the very fact that I'm allowing these words to come out of my mouth are committing me to support yeah. you and to be there with you every time, all the times you need. No, it's not that, oh, you tried and you were mistaken. I'm tired of you. I'm sorry. No, no. I, I mean, if I pointed to that, I'm perpetually connected. And for me, that's the also the idea of being a, a guru of some way or another. I mean, you are empowered ideally to in instruct and guide others, but that's a huge commitment for you to remain as an elder, <laughs> joining the other person and, and being patient and waiting and loving and merciful uh, and having this wider vision that you mentioned, you know, I, I refer to that in my book as anticipatory go Like, mm -hmm. like you, you can see, like the elder is a prophet, basically. You use the word right. visionary, and prophet basically means a similar thing. It's not necessarily you have some crystal ball that you are seeing, but your own experience, your own seeing, as you mentioned, I like that. You said, okay, an elder has gone through so much in time that he or she will understand how the nature of reality is constant change and adaptation. So he or she will be willing at that elderly point to acknowledge the, the next need for change and adaptation instead of clinging to a toxic nostalgia and let's do things as it will always do and trying to bring everything back. We talked about that with Bhakti Rasa last week and like this toxic self sense of nostalgia, mm -hmm. but actually being dynamic. And I will say in that connection, an important point for an elder is uh, he or she has to be listening to the young generations. Because even if the elder have gone through so much and there is experience and so on, he or she has to be open to, there are some things that I'm missing because I I'm, I'm have a different programming. It's okay, it's not bad, but I'm seeing the world with a wider lens, as you mentioned, with a wider light. But it doesn't mean that younger generations are seeing, are not seeing I mean, I'm not seeing anything else apart from what I'm seeing. So, and I think that's quite lacking generally. I was seeing mm. the other day one, one interview from one <clears throat> Franciscan nun that actually I, I'll be interviewing next week and I will mention. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. She's a scientist and a theologian as well. And she was, she's 60 something, I will say. And she was interviewing like, again, second generation Christian devotees, so to say, no? And she was asking, so what's the thing that you feel most lacking from our generation? And they will mention basically, they are not willing to hear us, to listen mm -hmm. to us. No. And I was like, oops, it, it gave me chills when I was, they would sound like deja vu, like this is happening in a few other places. In fact, mm -hmm. I remember when, when I visited Richard Rohr in, in New Mexico in February, and, and I was sharing with him some of these issues in our community, and he will be like, we have our own version of that one. We ha I have that. He was checking all the boxes. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. His turn to share his own uh, traumatic experiences. So to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, we have that one. We have that one. So I'm clarifying this because, again, this is not just about Gaudiya community. It's just a right. pattern in, in, in humanity, human psyche, and so on. As, as an elder, it's also a pattern beyond our own community, but I, I really, I, I since I mentioned Richard Rohr regarding talking about elderhood, that comes to mind that he mentioned many times three things that I appreciate how he explained. And he said, an elder must have hope, faith, hope, and love. And he will translate these three very interestingly. He will say faith means tolerance for ambiguity, ambiguity. Mm -hmm. An elder must have tolerance for ambiguity. It has to know how to navigate those waters with, without freaking out, so to say. <laughs> an elder has to have, must have hope, which means he has to have or she has to have an ability to hold creative tensions. Mm -hmm. 
Again, that that's that's not something you learn just by being old. You have to yeah. go through stuff. And love, he will translate. An elder has to have the ability to care, be, to care for others beyond one's own advantage. Which again, mm. sometimes that's not happening. We see it. sometimes I care for you in terms of my advantage, right. as long as it's nourishing my particular comfort mm. zone. I love you. I care for you. I give myself to you. But the real proof of caring is. I'm not obtaining anything from you in one sense from my personal advantage. And that's where I will be obtaining the most for you, from you, of mm. course. I will be able to give for you. So I appreciate that he defined it an elder with these three words, hmm? faith, hope, and love. And, and, and especially I appreciate how he defined them. Because again, we will we, we might think we already know what's faith, hope, and love, love, but not generally thinking in terms of dealing with ambiguity and creative tension and caring for others beyond one's area of interest. So, yeah, I, I think that's... Uh, but I, I would like to, yeah, to emphasize that, no, the importance of not so much uh, being an elder means... I mean, being an elder means just being an elder, it's enough in one sense. If you're an elder, just being there... That's <laughs> right, yeah, sure. That's enough. I mean, your presence is healing, basically, in the midst of the world. Just having someone like that existing, it's already healing in, in every direction. Uh, and that's what and an elder is not someone, and I mentioned that in my book, who is like anxious about instructing others or having followers. But And he or she has the potential to do so. But the fact that he's not or she's not anxious about that makes truly that person an elder. Uh, yeah, and in connection to that, I think part of what you were saying, the, the intergenerational connection, mm -hmm. is that because the elder is brave and because the elder is unafraid of seeming contradiction or paradox, they're totally curious about what the new generation has to say and has to offer. They're not afraid. Mm -hmm. Usually a lack of curiosity, a lack of interest in the younger generation is a fear the movement's going to fall apart. They're going to get the philosophy wrong. Our thing is going to shrink. We're not going to hit the numbers. We're not distributing books like we used to. Right. Our kirtans were better. And when pro, you know, it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a form of, again, it, it reads to me as sort of like low self-worth that the time when I was thriving from the perspective of the elder. Yeah. And, and I say this in all humility because I'm made my, my spiritual like flesh and bone is made from my elders. So I say mm -hmm. this with all humility, but, um, the time in which I was thriving was so long ago. And I'm not sure that I've grown that much since then. So it's got to look like what it looked like then, because that's the only growth that I knew. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I'm trying to project that pattern onto you guys, because that's how I know growth looks like. Mm -hmm. That for me reads as a little bit insecure, greater security, right? Trust, faith, as you were saying in, in Rohr's definition, faith is, I really do think you guys got this. I do. And I think that Krishna has you. And I think that grace will be a part of, you know, everything, every unfolding has grace infused in it. So let me be curious as to how this is going to unfold with your generation. Let me be curious about your ideas. Let me be curious about your intuitions. Let me hold space for you to explore and also hold, hold space for, if I've done my job correctly as an elder, then you all are learning from my example. I don't have to proselytize so much. I don't have to explain so many things because again, it becomes self-evident. It's a behavior thing. We learn in relationship less by what people say and more by what people do and how they treat us. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to instruct so much and kind of slam you with all this information. If the relationship itself, the container itself is giving you that nourishment, that understanding and those lessons, then automatically I give you the safe space where it can unfold. Your highest potential can unfold because I've suffused it with love. Hmm. Thank you. Let me share a brief comment that was made in this connection. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Gail Rosangi Lewis, Daniel, she's saying, I think that elders need to feel the love and respect of the younger generations, which gives them permission to share their wisdom. What will you like to share in that connection? So that, that the elders need to feel loved and respected by the younger generations. Is mm -hmm. that what I'm, is that what you're mm -hmm. understanding mm -hmm. too? Mm -hmm. That somehow yeah. that will be the way that they will feel that permission is given to them to share their wisdom. Yeah. So love from, from my experience, uh, personally <laughs> and professionally, um, love and respect are not things that you can 
demand. It can't yeah. even be something that you enforce or mm -hmm. um, even really encourage. It's born of the relationship. Mm -hmm. It's something that's earned automatically. And it's something that has to be taught by example. So when we see our elders, we need to see how they love and respect other people. And it should be so mesmerizing, so captivating, so real, so touching, so totally different than the exploitive or mechanical relationships of our material encounters that we naturally gravitate toward that because that is our essential nature. If we're thinking that love or respect or healthy relationships is something that I don't have and so I must force and I have to learn how to do that, then what I'm doing is denying my own divine nature. I'm actually programmed for that. Mm -hmm. I'm actually programmed for love. I'm actually programmed for respect. So by law of resonance, when I see it, I gravitate towards it. A healthy vessel will gravitate toward another healthy vessel that is loving and respecting. It's something that is totally organic, right? Yeah. And if there's something that gets in the way, if there's some rust, if there's some damage, then I need to address that. And, under, and that kind of brings us full circle to, to doing the inner work. If I can't love, if I can't respect a worthy elder, then I need to take a look at what's going on. And if a, an elder, by certain qualifications, is not seemingly uh, earned or has, has, hasn't has been able to command that love and respect, then I also want to see what's going on there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's something that should be organic and automatic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because the moment it stops being organic, it starts to become an oxymoron. It starts to That's become right. a contradiction of the very term love. Right. And respect. I mean, love and re forced love is not love. Imposed respect is not respect. It's That's like right. an insult, basically. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I mean, if you are actually an elder, and again, I think it's important to over and over re again repeat the same idea. Elder doesn't mean old people. <laughs> elder means uh, you can be younger in age and be an elder. Again, it's not necessarily someone who has gray hair and seventy-five years. Uh, although generally for elder we may think of that and, and it's okay I'm not, I'm not against that idea of course there's a, a thing to go and through the whole of life spirits to converge in that point but again mere age doesn't uh, equate with wisdom so if you're an elder to begin with you are not expecting anything from anyone your own elderhood is enough <laughs> no the, the, the place you have arrived internally as a true genuine elder as you mentioned, it's, it, it will command whatever it needs to command. It won't demand anything. It's just commanding by flow and inspiration, whatever needs to come. So, I mean, there's something commenting here, Rasang, in this connection, maybe some clarification to her question or comment. What I'm saying is that it is risky for many of us to trust that what we have is valuable. There needs to be openness and receptivity to what, what the elder has to offer. Ageism is alive and well, and many elders do not feel that they have value. Yeah, I will connect again that to <clears throat> to what uh, Tanya mentioned before in relation in relation to one's own self worth, uh, because uh, if if you are a true elder, at the same time, uh, you can know that what you have is valuable in full humility. Now, there is place for that. <laughs> if you reach a place of true, genuine elderhood. You can also acknowledge I have many valuable things which are not mine. They are not my own merit. It, they are came as gifts, but they are there. So you will have a healthy sense of self-worth. So in that sense, it won't depend on what people say, what they do not say. Uh, so and, and again, yeah. if you are if you are positioned in that situation, as you mentioned, it will naturally create this like reciprocation from other younger generations of that's attractive. That's like a magnet, so to say. You know, it's not forced, like, respect me. I have something important. Value me. But uh, And I will pound on that post. If it's not happening organically. Uh, and yeah, all of us are, as, as Rasang is mentioning, many of us are still growing and finding our own value. Totally. It's an ongoing process. There's no end to that. <laughs> well, I, I wanted I'm, to also kind of mention that, you know, I, th I think that there there is that the finding of your own voice and trusting you know that this is this is krishna asking me to use my voice and my instrument this is my kirtan i'm choosing to share wisdom mm. in this way and sankirtan meaning i'm choosing to share it in community and this is my contribution that's what my voice sounds like it is a a, a statement of our self-worth and i think also 
to her, to her earlier point, elder recognizes elder. Mm -hmm. To be an elder is to give space and give strength and encourage other elders to share their voice. And there's been a, a, a lack of that in our society also, especially if your voice happens to be embodied in the female form. There's mm -hmm. a, a lack of recognition of elders that are present and because they are sometimes painfully humble, right? Mm -hmm. Or they've been so battered mm -hmm. down by the lack of space and the lack of representation and the lack of acknowledgement, not their own personal acknowledgement, but even other people's acknowledgement, that it becomes extremely discouraging. And then they do transmit their wisdom and their brilliance, but it's to an extremely reduced circle. And many people miss out on that association. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many people feel with like Yamuna Prabhu or so many people, myself included. I mean, I, I got to know her story through people who were close to her, but her circle was so reduced, especially toward the end of her life. Because, and a lot of it was societal circumstances and the way that other people were not able to like fully comprehend the extent of her wisdom and the, her experience and how she was a living elder, even from an extremely young age, she was considered to be a, a, an elder. So it's the perfect example of how if there aren't elders, you will also miss out on other elders who are around because there's, a, there's the experience of recognition and encouragement and holding space of elders among elders where they like to pass the mic and they like mm -hmm. to allow other people to illuminate and they, they're mutually encouraged by that sangha because that's their sangha of elders mm -hmm. conferring with elders. They get so much nourishment from that relationship amongst themselves and they also recognize like this person has brilliant contributions that the next generation could so greatly benefit from because I'm equally invested in this person mm. who may be my contemporary, so to speak, and I'm so deeply invested in the next generation. So I think it's also creating space and creating acknowledgement, but only a, a real elder could recognize another real elder, just like, you know, when, when we say like, you know, Utam Bhakta is like the only one could recognize another. And if you mm. don't, you know, and if you're not really sure, then it's because you don't have the eyes to see yet, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that reminds me of what, how Krishna basically defines Sadhu Sangha in the Bhagavad Gita, what he says, Bodhaya and Taparashparam, both of them are enlightening one another. He's not generally necessarily saying they are elders, but he's just describing this like natural pattern of right. trust and appreciation, even if you're a newcomer, but that's a, a principle of elderhood, so to say. Like mutual enlightenment, mutual appreciation, mutual... Uh, instead of, as you mentioned, this fear of trusting others, of empowering others, and an encouragement. You were you 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 the word encouragement. I always like to define encouragement. In courage, you connected with courage, and courage, as I define, Brené Brown herself says that courage has to do with vulnerability. No, because you cannot. If you try to think a moment in your life, you were courageous you are totally vulnerable in that moment. If not, you cannot be courageous. <laughs> so in order to give encouragement to make others courageous, you have to make them aware. You have to be vulnerable to begin with you know, as an elder and help others to be vulnerable as younger generations. So I, I like to, to, to establish this connection between vulnerability, courage, encouragement. Mm -hmm. Because and, we, and the elders are expected to give encouragement but for that, there has to be courage and vulnerability in the background. So, and they have to be vulnerable themselves. And being vulnerable implies also, yeah, taking the steps of passing the baton, even if it may sound risky at some point, and not being just paralyzed by fear of what will happen, as you mentioned, and being overtly attached to a particular sense of what progress should look like and spiritual advancement and being willing. I like your, your word that you mentioned, curiosity, to remain in that curious space. It's not just only for elder for just some moment. We are eternally invited to remain curious because the mm -hmm. object of our exploration is infinite and ending. So, <laughs> so I, I think we need a lot of that also in our particular tradition to, to mm -hmm. cure, healthy curiosity that will begun begot healthy trust. Uh, there is one comment here just to to reach our conclusion. Just Jamanuja saying in the society of Krishna consciousness where people are coming from different backgrounds. Some people may not have the education to value elders. Even the elders may be giving all the love they can. It is about education in all aspects. Yeah, of course, we are here not pointing at to like 
one direction or the other, like poor, younger, second generation devotees, they are so unappreciated and all these old, old guy people, nostalgic guys are traumatizing our new guy. I mean, there's so much learning and specificity in each particular case. We are just trying to, yeah, highlight a few, a few aspects in that connection. So, Danny, I don't know if we are reaching the conclusion of our meeting, I will say. So if you have anything that you would like to share, something you feel was missing, something, some wrapping up, some full circle, whatever, you may like to invoke in connection to today's topic. Well, I think that, you know, one of the things that I'm grateful for in your sharings and in, especially in your conversations with others is that you welcome a healthy critique mm -hmm. of the status quo and a healthy critique of our own role in the status quo. I think that it's very powerful to um, stay in that space, you know, what you sometimes describe as the liminal space, which is like, well, I know the old way is not working, and I don't really see what the new way is. And so, well, here I am, and I just got to have to live my day, and then tomorrow might be the same. So I think that that... Um, Comfort with discomfort, the willingness to do that, I think that that can really only be done thoroughly and successfully in good company. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the importance of relationships can't be overstated. I think that everything that we're looking to do in our spiritual life and even in our material life it has to be done in the context of healthy relationships because otherwise what we're going to do when we pass that baton is that we're going to pass the baton with all of our baggage. Yeah. And it's going to be very difficult for future mm -hmm. generations or even for, for ourselves to sift through and see what is what. So I think that as a service to the purity of our message, to the purity of our scriptures, to the purity of our acharyas is to leave as much of our own baggage off of it as possible Mm -hmm. And hand over something that is clean, something that is pure, something that's well taken care of, which means that my hands have to be clean as I'm passing it on. I can't leave my smudge marks on something that I'm passing on. Essentially, it's clean. But how will the receiving party know that if they receive something smudged? So mm -hmm. I think that it's so important to do our own personal work. It's so important to cherish these healthy relationships. And as we were saying earlier, it doesn't have to be mass relationships they have to be deep they have to be deep yeah. and they have to be real and i think that we have to mutually support each other in in how we explore it i think that we have to take into consideration as we were saying kind of through the comments the voices of people that have historically gone unheard i think that it's interesting that we can intuit that feminine energy, which is typically embodied in a female form let's say in the role of mother or the role of you know woman in in, in this life they're intuitively relational. So I don't think that it's any wonder that we're struggling in our relationships when we're tamping down the embodiment or the people who are perhaps best attuned to the relational arena. Mm -hmm. How can our relationships thrive if the mm -hmm. people who have a natural knack for that are not thriving? Mm -hmm. So I think that it's also allowing your specific wisdom to come through embodied in a safe way. Right. And so I feel that, yeah, I think that allowing the feminine, not necessarily just the female form, but that feminine, mm -hmm. the relation, mm -hmm. grace, community, that grandmother energy, the motherly energy, the nurturing, the matriarch, all of that energy mm -hmm. that is necessary. And that could be embodied through a male or female form. It needs to come through because it's been too far kind of skewed in the opposite direction. And what's happening is our relationships are like really suffering. We're going like very rugged individualist. We're going very achievement oriented. We're going very kind of isolation, false renunciation. And, and it's sort of, sort of like hyper masculinizing our situation. Yeah. So I think that even just this, you know, two people sitting down and then, you know, exposing our, our conversation to the community, we're basically saying, watch us relate. <laughs> And hopefully we'll do our best to, to show up authentically. Yeah. I think that there needs to be, I think that there needs to be more of this. And I appreciate so much your service in doing this and your willingness to put your own, you know, vulnerability and your own authenticity out there and inviting someone else to do that. And I think that again, by resonance, when you show up and do that, you invite the other person to do it, it becomes easier to do. So I think it's, it's <laughs> more of this and small pockets all around and making it very much like a grassroots 
effort where we all kind of, you know, the, they say like the rising tide that lifts all ships, mm -hmm. right? Even these seemingly mm -hmm. massive vessels of like incalculably large issues that we might have, that rising tide, you know, that rising tide, it could really be healthy relationships. That's my conviction. And, and, and that's where I'm, I'm trying to put my energy. So I, yeah, I really value that. And I just want to highlight that and, and appreciate you for creating the space. Thank you so much. Brenda Sunder is saying, I'm feeling energized by this combo. <laughs> <laughs> I feel energized myself. So thank you so much, Danny, for that. And yeah, to, to me, what you just shared is kind of a definition of what ideally parampara should be. What an ideal is like natural system of transferring like heart to heart things. And instead of the contrary, as I mentioned in my book, sometimes in the name of parampara, we are passing unresolved trauma. <laughs> <laughs> that's not for Ampura, not just giving like a unrefined product that you needed to do your part on just for the other generation. Okay, you deal with my own unresolved issue on, and you have your own unresolved issue on top of that. So we are adding to the problem instead of the solution. So I, I really appreciate your point of how we can how somehow counteract that, especially reflecting on the topic of the feminine. And I will emphasize as a male-bodied guy <laughs> that, of course, I think one of the main aspects in which the feminine has to be reclaimed and redeemed is, especially in, in the case of male people, in the sense of the fact that male guys have not properly embodied the feminine side led to them abuse the feminine in the form of feminine-bodied personalities, so to say, mm -hmm. because they are not able to, to begin with to value and acknowledge the female feminine side of their own personality so that by extension ends up like canceling and abusing especially when that appears literally embodied that mm -hmm. in front of them in the form of a lady so to say so i from my particular male side although i don't want to over identify myself my as a male but i i prefer really to draw on the on the female side of myself because i feel that's so much so much required to reclaim and redeem the feminine throughout everywhere so yeah i want to share that in connection to mm. that and i really appreciate your 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 appreciation of what i'm trying to do which again it's not me trying to do something i'm a hero i'm a martyr i'm just it's just a intuitive necessity that comes to me for the particular side gaze we are in like we really need to show up and name and frame certain things but not pointing at people but just naming and framing things that need to be addressed to begin with in, in our mm. own heart and yet the most powerful way to do it is just as you mentioned hopefully giving an example of okay we are having a conversation uh we are showing up having a conversation being as vulnerable as we can we are having a conversation that hopefully will be the same conversation we will having outside of the camera outside of the streaming so yeah. nothing has been rehearsed there is no script here <laughs> So hopefully we can create, as you mentioned, that that resonance mm -hmm. that that may inspire everyone else to continue engaging in this exercise, which is basically what what we are about: integration through relationships. So yeah, thank you so much, Danny. Again, thank, thank you so you. much to everyone connected. I will share again her contact for those who will like. Uh, here it is. You can find her on Instagram, Danya Wellness or Danya Music. Mm -hmm. To get in touch with her and before we conclude let me share a few words regarding our next episode which will be next saturday i'll be in sweden so hopefully you're already aligned with the local timing and next next week we'll start september so first month of this uh, podcast we started inviting some male bishnaps although it was not thought like that but it happened and eventually i think okay let's make let's balance the equation by inviting bishnavis on this august month that i did and next month, maybe all of them, probably not, I'm still organizing, but many of them will be what I like to call non-Gaudiya devotees. Not non-devotees, <laughs> but devotees from different traditions, some of them from mystical Christianity and other traditions. So next Saturday, I will be inviting Ilya Delio. She's a Franciscan nun. As I mentioned before, she's a scientist. She's a theologian. She's an author. She's a very interesting personality. So we'll be meeting with her on Friday because that's when she, when she can. Next Friday, September 1st at 10 a.m., going back to the typical timing, 10 a.m. EDT time. And in connection to some of the things we were touching up on the end now about the future of our tradition, anticipatory Vaishnavism, 
the, the title of our episode will be A New Language for the Future. Mm -hmm. So we'll be addressing this, this point of the importance of even finding a language and words that may help us to, like, uh, yeah, decrypt and understand which are the present needs where we are now. So, again, that will be next week. So thank you so much, and we'll see you there. Thank you so much, Dania, for joining us thank again. You. And see you very soon. <clears throat>